Secretive, ill-mannered, yet brave and loyal to a fault, the dwarves of Middle-earth are some of the most curious creatures in all of Tolkien's works, and these sons of Durin play a unique and truly special role in the history of the Lord of the Rings universe. The dwarves have an origin unlike any other in Middle-earth. Long ago, the races of elves and men were given life by Iluvatar, the creator of Middle-earth, and they're known far and wide as his children. The dwarves, however, come from somewhere else. They're crafted by Aule, one of the Valar, the pantheon of angelic guardians who first helped Iluvatar bring the universe into existence. Known to his dwarven sub-creations as Mahal, Aule fashions the dwarves in the very early days of Middle-earth's existence, having grown impatient at the slow awakening of the children of Iluvatar. Shaped deep under a mountain in Middle-earth, the first batch of Aule's creations were known as the Seven Fathers of the Dwarves. Eventually, the all-knowing Iluvatar calls Aule out on his impatience. He points out that, while Aule may be a master craftsman, he lacks the power to give each dwarf their own will. Seeing that his creations are little more than empty husks, Aule repents and offers to destroy them. But Iluvatar decides to spare his repentant servant's handiwork, giving the dwarves independent will and adopting them into his family of children. Each of the seven fathers is then put to sleep and spread across Middle-earth, where they remain in silent slumber until the elves finally begin to awake. The first dwarf to stir from his slumber is Durin, the father of the dwarven clan known as the Longbeards. After waking up, Durin wanders around Middle-earth before settling down in the area that eventually becomes Khazad-dûm, or Moria, as the elves later call it. Four of the other dwarven fathers wake up far to the east, and they aren't talked about much in Tolkien's work. However, the last pair of dwarven fathers appear in the Blue Mountains to the west of Khazad-dûm, and they found the famous cities of Belagost and Nograd. These two cities play an important part in the first stage of Middle-earth history, as the inhabitants befriend the elven exiles who live in the western region known as Beleriand, and join them in their war against the Dark Lord Morgoth. They also help the elves carve out their vast underground palaces, craft their gems and weapons, and even aid them in battle. Unfortunately, this peaceful time is short-lived. After a great elven king refuses to pay up for their work, the dwarves kill him, setting off a bitter feud that sparks several retaliatory conflicts and feeds into a less than savory reputation for the dwarves. At the end of the First Age, Morgoth is defeated, Beleriand is sunk under the sea, and the surviving dwarves in the Blue Mountains travel east to join their relatives in the Misty Mountains. During the Second Age of Middle-earth, Many of the survivors from Belagost and Nograd join the thriving kingdom of Khazad-dûm, where their knowledge and experience launch the dwarven realm into further glory. At this point, the western gates of Khazad-dûm open right up into the elvish kingdom of Erygian, the region the Fellowship of the Ring later travels through on their way to Mordor. At first, the Second Age sees a healing of the relationship between the elves and the dwarves. At one point, they even allow Galadriel to journey through Khazad-dûm so that she can visit Lothlorien for the first time. Later, war breaks out between the elves and Morgoth's greatest lieutenant, Sauron, and in response, the dwarves pour out of Khazad-dûm to aid their allies. But their help comes too late, and the dwarves are forced to retreat back into their mountain kingdom. After that, the dwarves mostly stay out of the war, it's not until the final showdown with Sauron, during the War of the Last Alliance, that the dwarves of Khazad-dûm come out to support the free peoples of Middle-earth. But the battles of the later Second Age weren't the dwarves' first encounter with Sauron. Earlier in that era, Sauron had attempted to bring Durin's folk under his influence by offering rings of power to the seven great dwarf kings. When Sauron forges his Master Ring, however, He's unable to control the dwarven kings. Instead, he finds that the tough hardiness of the dwarves makes them more or less impervious to his direct control. 
but that doesn't mean the Dwarven Rings are harmless. Although they don't fall under Sauron's spell, the Dwarf Rings kindle an overpowering greed for gold in the hearts of their owners, a greed that later brings great ruin to no small number of Dwarven Lords. These rings also amplify their skills and desires, and each one is supposed to have been the foundation of a great Dwarven hoard of wealth. Eventually, four of the Dwarven Rings are destroyed by Dragonfire, while the other three are recovered by Sauron, leaving the Dwarves to manage their great wealth without the powers of their magical rings. After the first defeat of Sauron, the Third Age begins fairly quietly. The Dwarves go on busily mining in their underground kingdoms, and Khazad-dûm, in particular, continues to thrive. Roughly 1,300 years into the Age, Orcs begin to repopulate and harass the Dwarves in Moria, but they're mostly held at bay by the warriors of Khazad-dûm. Then, in the year 1980 of the Third Age, something terrible happens. The Dwarves of Khazad-dûm wake a Belrog. You know what they awoke in the darkness of Khazad-dûm. Shadow and flame. This ancient servant of Morgoth kills King Durin VI and forces the Longbeards to flee their ancient home and scatter across the world. Some of them find their way to the Lonely Mountain in Erebor, where they establish a new kingdom under the mountain. Others, meanwhile, head north and settle in the Grey Mountains, Although these particular refugees manage to rebuild their strength over the next few centuries, their relocation to the north of Middle-earth puts them in close proximity to the Withered Heath, a land populated by dragons. Conflict soon erupts between the dwarves and their new fiery neighbors, and most of the survivors are forced to relocate all over again, this time joining their kin under the Lonely Mountain. Unfortunately, the dragons aren't done with the dwarves just yet. One drake in particular hears of the great riches of the Lonely Mountain and decides to pay a visit to the dwarves of Erebor. When Smaug attacks the Lonely Mountain, it spells doom for the Longbeards. Already driven out of Moria by Durin's bane, the few surviving dwarves once again find themselves on the run. Many head further east to the Iron Hills. Another group of dwarves under the King Thror head south, where they adopt a wandering, homeless lifestyle. After that, the dwarf King Thror becomes tired of his people's constant defeats and lonely wanderings and starts to go a little bit out of his mind. He decides to head back to Moria to scout out the land, whereupon he's quickly killed and mutilated by the orcs that have taken up residence in the dwarves' absence. This act of regicide sparks the War of the Dwarves and Orcs. Over the next three years, dwarves from all of the seven households gather together to attack the orcs of the Misty Mountains. The war culminates with an epic battle in front of the gates of Moria, where, according to the books, they successfully kill the orc leader Azog. After their victory, the dwarves refuse to repopulate Moria, knowing that there's a Balrog on the loose, and they scatter back to their homes leaving the Longbeard still without a home. Roughly 150 years after the battle outside Moria, Thorin Oakenshield meets Gandalf the Grey in the Inn at Bree. They recruit a dozen dwarves and a certain timid hobbit and set out on a quest to reclaim their treasure from Smaug. Nope. After the dragon is defeated and the kingdom under the mountain is restored, the dwarves find a new lease on life. With a new hoard of gold and jewels in hand, they set up shop as one of the dominant forces in northern Middle-earth, just in time for the War of the Ring. While the dwarves aren't shown much throughout the Lord of the Rings, they do play an important side role by helping to keep the forces of evil at bay in the north. In fact, in the appendix for The Return of the King, Gandalf explains that Dane, the dwarven king at the time, is killed fighting Easterlings at the gates of Erebor. Nevertheless, the dwarves and their allies successfully keep the northern regions of Middle-earth safe while the events in the main narrative unfold. After the War of the Ring wraps up, Gimli returns to the Lonely Mountain and brings a group of his people back to Rohan, or more specifically, to Helm's Deep. There, 
the dwarves establish a new home in the glittering caves, a place that Gimli himself dubbed one of the marvels of the northern world in the Two Towers. Gimli, now the lord of the glittering caves, also helps to repair the broken gates of Minas Tirith around this time. It is also said that King Durin VII, the last king to be named after the founder of the Longbeards, finally reclaims Khazad-dûm and restores it to its former glory. Eventually, the dwarves begin to diminish in importance, and their race slowly dwindles until it comes to an end at an undisclosed point in time. Perhaps the most fitting ending to the dwarven history is the touching story that Gimli, friend to elves and avid devotee to Galadriel, is eventually given permission to board one of the last ships to the Undying Lands. He sails west with his friend Legolas to enjoy an earthly retirement in the blessed realm beyond the sea, and he's reportedly the only dwarf to ever be given such an honor. So. You know the history of the dwarves and how they first came to be. But here's the question. Just what are dwarves in Tolkien's mythology? It's clear enough from their origins that the dwarves are unique among the many races of Middle-earth, but they have plenty of other facets that make them distinct from elves, men, or hobbits too. Nobody touches a dwarf! Take their basic physicality, for example. Dwarves are short, but not quite as short as hobbits, who are typically between 2 and 4 feet tall. In comparison, dwarves usually come in at around 4 to 4 and a half feet tall. They're also tremendously strong, stout, and stocky. While hobbits are known for their clean-shaven faces, dwarves are specifically marked by their remarkably long beards, which they wear with great pride. When Aule first created the dwarves, he designed them to be tough in order to endure the perils of Middle-earth. They're also famously stubborn and always remain incredibly loyal to their friends and equally bitter to their enemies. While there's no hard and fast number regarding their lifespan, they definitely outlive men and often live to be hundreds of years old, with Dwalin in particular living to the ripe old age of 340. Culturally, the dwarves share many things with the other free peoples of Middle-earth. Although they tend to put their own unique spin on each one, their music, for instance, is highly developed, and in The Hobbit, all of Thorin's companions show off their musical skills on a number of different instruments. But unlike the music of the elves, most of their songs aren't light and ethereal. They're slow, methodical, and moody. The dwarven language is also unique. The Silmarillion states that Aule invented a language for them and began to teach it to them right at their inception. Their language is said to be cumbrous and unlovely and is kept very secret indeed. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.